Hey parents, you're listening to the Project Parenthood podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nanika Kaur, clinical psychologist and respectful parenting therapist. Each week, I'll introduce you to the same respectful parenting practices that I use to help parents repair and deepen connections with their children. You'll get tips for cultivating more parental self-compassion, more cooperation from your kids, and more joy, peace, and resilience in your relationship with them. In today's episode, I'm talking with Dr. Lucrece Rupert, a child, adolescent, and adult psychologist who specializes in neurodiversity, such as ADHD, autism, and learning differences. You're going to hear about the double marginalization of being Black and neurodivergent, and how to find neurodiversity-informing care for your child. Stick around till the end to learn about important things to advocate for on your child's Individual Education Plan, or IEP. Lucrezi Rupert, MD, is a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist who specializes in neurodiversity, like ADHD, autism, and learning differences, children with trauma, children in foster care or who have been adopted, and adults with developmental disabilities. She completed medical school and her adult psychiatry residency at the University of South Alabama. She completed her child and adolescent psychiatry fellowship at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She currently aids in the fight towards racial, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious, a-religious, disability, and neurodiverse equality through her work as a co-founder of Physician Women SOAR. That's S-O-A-R, or Support, Organize, Advocate, Reclaim, an organization of physician women that raises money, awareness, and educates for the aforementioned intersectional causes. Dr. Rupert also serves her community through her participation in B-L-A-C-K, Black Leaders Acquiring Collective Knowledge. She aims to help empower those with mental health diagnoses and neurodiversity through her company, Insightful Consultant, LLC, via speaking engagements, education, and training on a plethora of mental health and diversity-related topics. Dr. Rupert is also an adoptive parent of two wonderful children, and she enjoys traveling, exploring new places, and spending quality time with her family. Here's my chat with Dr. Rupert. Hi, everyone. I'm here now with child adolescent and adult psychiatrist, Dr. Lucrece Rupert. Dr. Rupert, I'm so glad to have you here at Project Parenthood to talk with us about supporting and advocating for neurodiverse Black children and the impact of systemic issues in society on whether or not some neurodivergent Black kids are seen and supported at all in educational and clinical settings. So thanks so much for being here to talk with us. Thank you. I'm, I'm very um, happy for the invite and very excited about this topic. Um, neurodiversity in general is is my passion, but of course, I, I focus or tend to focus on Black neurodiversity because I'm Black. <laughs> so yeah, I was actually going to start there. I was wondering yeah. if you could tell us a little bit about your own journey and how it led you to to specializing in neurodiversity. Yeah, so I went I actually went into medical school. I wanted to be a doctor since I was like five years old. I wanted to be a pediatrician, and I always wanted to be a pediatrician that helped kids, particularly abused kids. It really, child psychiatry fits that, right? But growing up, a poor kid in Mississippi from a super religious family, we didn't really talk about psychiatry in general. So I didn't, I don't know that I even knew what a psychiatrist was growing up. Um, So get to medical school, um, do all of my rotations. I loved anything that had to do with kids. So still thinking very strongly, I'm going to be a pediatrician. My very last rotation of third year, which is the year we have to choose like what specialty we want to do. um, My very last rotation was psychiatry. And just by chance, I was assigned to child psychiatry for that month. So I go, you know, go to my rotation. I had heard from lots of people who have done it. Like, it's going to be super sad. You're going to cry all the time. You're not going to like it. So I'm like, that's fine. I just use it to study for my boards. Um, Get there. Loved it. The attending that I was working with was like, you're not going to be a pediatrician. You're going to be a child psychiatrist. At this point, I already had started choosing like residency programs I want to go to. I hadn't filled out the applications yet. It wasn't time for that. But I had started choosing. I had wrote my like personal statement. And I'm like, oh, no, I won't be changing like that's No. So then, of course, by the end of the rotation, I, of course, come up to him and I'm like, by the way, can I get a letter of communication because I'm changing to child psychiatry? Um, so it really, even before I knew, well, I won't say before I knew I was neurodiverse, I kind of figured I was out, I was ADHD in, in medical school. Um, but at that time, I was not officially diagnosed yet. 
So even before I kind of started this neurodiverse journey, um, child psychiatry really spoke to me. I loved just being able to really change. You know, you could change the trajectory of someone's complete life in their childhood. So that really just reached out to me. I loved it. So like I said, in medical school, um, I kind of figured out that I was ADHD, went to go get tested for it um, at some point and went to a, a psychologist. It was an older white male who did my testing. He told me that I did not have ADHD, but didn't really give any guidance in general. So I, I requested my medical records. Uh, once I got my re- medical records, I saw that he had put that I had narcissistic traits because I thought I can do great things like be in medical school. Let's note that I was actually in medical school at this time. (laughs) So it's not like I had thoughts that I could do something that I couldn't do. I was actively doing it. I mean, he basically said that I just wasn't smart enough to be a doctor. And that's that was the issue. Obviously, I didn't pay that any mind because, I mean, obviously, I was already in medical school. I was doing it like. That wasn't, you know, but I will say that medical school did really make me question my intelligence because it was so hard for me as somebody with ADHD. And I survived through all of my schooling using flashcards, but you can't use flashcards in medical school. Like it's just too much information to like sit out and write that. It did make me question, like, I mean, my self-esteem did drop, but it wasn't because I wasn't smart enough to be in med school. It's because I had untreated ADHD. Uh, We have to take a test. All physicians have to take a test that when you pass it, that that allows you to, you know, say you're a physician, a general physician. And then once you finish your specialized training, you take another test to say you're a pediatrician, psychiatrist, internal medicine, whatever. So that test, Um, it was over two days. It was, I think, eight hours or eight or nine hours the first day and like five hours the second day. Um, Just way too much time for me to sit and focus and concentrate. So that's when I decided to go get tested again. Same time. In residency, I also decided to be a foster parent. And both of my kiddos that I ended up adopting through the foster care symptoms are also neurodiverse. So at the same time as I was kind of discovering my neurodiversity, I was going through testing with them and and their neurodiversity. So that just kind of led, it just brought everything full circle. It just kind of led, you know, I'm neurodiverse. My kids are neurodiverse. Like my life is kind of centered around neurodiversity. I do really well with these patients. So it just kind of, I guess I never said, hey, I'm going to specialize in neurodiversity. I just do really well. And people just start sending these patients to me. So that's kind of how that came about. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that explanation. You know, that's how so many mental health workers come to doing the work that they do that because they've been touched by it personally. As we begin this conversation, I wanted to start off with a few definition of terms, um, definition Mm -hmm. of terms that may come up while we're talking. And specifically, I wanted, I wondered if you could explain what's meant by terms like ableism and neurodiversity affirming. So neurodiversity itself is a term that was kind of coined, I think, initially by the autistic community. The medical model is a, is a deficit model, right? So we diagnose things based on what you can't do. That's just the way it's set up now. There's lots to be said, you know, about that. But for right now, that's what we have. The autistic community, I think, was the first or at least the, the first to to kind of get it out there that we want to we want to be described by the things that we can do. And yes, we do have these difficulties, but there's also a lot of things that our brains at that time, you know, allow us to do better than other people. So they kind of coined the term neurodiversity as a way to describe the way your brain works differently than than the quote unquote typical person, but not from a deficit model. So that's how neurodiversity came about. And then neurodiversity affirming, you know, just like LGBTQ LGBTQ affirming and all of that is is people. um, So whether it's professionals, parents or whatever that allow you to thrive as someone neurodiverse instead of trying to make you a neurotypical person, which neurotypical is basically someone that doesn't have like ADHD or autism, you know, learning differences, things like that. Ableism. So that was, to my knowledge, first coined by the disability community. And ableism is just, well, not being affirming or not creating space for disabled people, which a lot of neurodiversity, uh, a lot of, or all diagnoses really in the neurodiversity community can also be a disability. Uh, But, you know, disability extends past that too. So physical disabilities, all of that good stuff. And so when you're ableism, you, you're overlooking like maybe the accommodations or just you're not seeing things through a disabled affirming lens. So for instance, I was talking about and this is a personal story that is, does not put me in a good light. Uh, but I was talking with a friend. I currently have mobility issues. So I have, you know, the neurodiverse kind of disability and I'm currently having some physical disability stuff. And I was talking with a friend how when I used to go, me, my mom normally comes with me on family trips. So me and my kids, my mom were at Disney World and I was getting so upset with her because she had to stop and take breaks. 
Um, and I'm like, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. That was me being ableist. And now as somebody that has physical mobility issues, which it shouldn't take that, but unfortunately for me, it did. Now, when I have to stop a tape brace, I'm like, oh my God, this is what I was doing to my mom, right? Yeah. And I'm thinking about looking through the lens, right? That so many people who are able-bodied, for instance, if mm-hmm. we're taking your example, an able-bodied person does not consider always the way a person who may have a physical disability would be able to access the same space, right? Like, are the people who own this business considering that not every person who wants to take part in this service is an able-bodied person? And I think that that's really something, um, you know, your own story just to, you know, sometimes we're just not imagining what life is like from the point of view of someone who life is different for. Can you talk about in light of that neurodiversity lens and ableism lens, can you talk about the stigma in the intersection of Black lived experience and neurodivergence? Yeah, I think in some ways, being ADHD and autistic, I'm autistic also in the Black community, for me, was kind of a blessing. And I'll talk about that first, and then I'll talk about the stigma. Southern Black communities (laughs) kind of tend to be more accepting of quote, unquote, weird people, right? So like, maybe you have that weird uncle, or maybe you have that weird cousin. And yeah, we just like, you know, they, they, they quote, unquote, off, but we just let them do what they do. But we still invite them you know, to the family functions and all that kind of stuff. So I, I felt like um, even though I was different, like I was always included in things. And I don't know that that would have been true in in not even maybe none Southern Black communities. I don't know that would have been true outside of my community that I grew up in. But with that said, the, the flip side is that Black people, um, you know, have been through a lot and we we're considered strong. And, and for a long time, we kind of took that title on as a badge of honor. And I think now people are kind of see that as it's really used to make us suffer more things than we should. And so we're like, nah, nah, we need help. You're so resilient. Um, so I can pile more things on you. Right, right, right. So, but because of that, you know, we didn't, we didn't seek out diagnosis. We didn't go to therapy. We didn't talk about psychiatric issues. We pray to God, God's supposed to fix it. You know, our ancestors, our, our recent ancestors, because we have ancestors before slavery, but our recent ancestors were slaves. If they can make it through that, why can't you make it through a bad day at work? Somebody always has it worse, which is true. Somebody does always have it worse, but that doesn't invalidate what you're going through. And so the flip side of that is when you have difficulties as a disabled or neurodiverse uh, person, you were supposed to somehow just get over it and just make it through, just make it happen, because that's what we do. So I think that was kind of the duality for me in in the Black community, uh, specifically the Black Southern community. Mm -hmm. This idea that you're supposed to sort of just sort of get over it, right? You're supposed to somehow work through it. This idea that right. there's um, that your brain is working differently is not in someone's mind. It's the idea you're just not trying right. hard enough. You just need to try right. harder, right? You're not trying or you don't have faith. If you if you are a Christian, which the ma- majority of, of Black people in the United States until recently were Christians, um, especially in the South. Um, so if you're a Christian, then, you know, it's the faith issue, right? You should be praying harder or, or maybe God's just testing you. You just going through this test. You're going to get rewarded in the end. Uh, you know, so many ways to frame that in a religious perspective that is not helpful. Right. Because it's, it's none of those things are addressing your day to day challenges. Right. right. And, you know, and I'm thinking too, of the, you talked about a deficit model and I think about bias and racial bias there's that that idea that black people somehow are operating at a deficit to begin with so the fact that you are having these challenges of course you're just not smart enough or you're just not working hard enough because that's what we think about black people anyway so i'm not mm-hmm. going to even diagnose you with a difficulty you're just black and that's why you've got problems right right exactly if you're you know, a black boy in in elementary school having behavior problems. Oh, they just probably come from a broken home, you know, oh, probably one of their parents is on drugs. Um, I definitely, you know, as a child psychiatrist, currently I stay in a not very diverse community, but I did my fellowship at UAB, which is Birmingham, Alabama. Um, And for those who, you know, are American and kind of know, Birmingham, Alabama is is a very black city. I saw lots of black kids that would come in on antipsychotics for behavior which I also sometimes prescribe antipsychotics for behavior. So I'm not, you know, saying totally against that. But they would come in on antipsychotics for behavior when the real issue was depression and not a, you know, not a depression med in sight. Or the real issue was ADHD, not a stimulant or other, you know, other types of medication that treat ADHD in sight. 
So they were treating this behavior because, quote unquote, the issue was that they were just bad. It wasn't looking for the reason of the behavior. Right, right. And I think that that's where, you know, Black people already are operating on this, you know, an able-bodied, neurotypical Black person is already having challenges getting the care that they need. And so I think that that's what I see a lot in my practice is that a lot of people who are people of color dealing with neurodiversity also have sometimes issues finding good care and finding non-biased care. You know, when we talk about making the world a more neurodiversity friendly place, there's often mention of unmasking or not requiring neurodivergent folks to mask so much. So can you talk about, first of all, what masking is? And then also like how masking and unmasking and code switching are are a different thing for a Black neurodivergent person than it might be for a non-Black neurodivergent person. Mm -hmm. So masking in the neurodiverse world refers to basically acting like a neurotypical person. Um, In some ways that you can do that is, uh, well, the biggest one is eye contact. So in in the neurotypical world, eye contact is a sign of respect. It's a sign of paying attention. For a lot of neurodiverse people, eye contact can be physically uncomfortable. Some people even describe it as physically actually painful. And some people, it's not necessarily painful, but they are able to pay more attention when they're not looking at you. Because when they're looking at you, they're focusing on like, oh, I need to do this right. And so they're able to like focus more when they're not looking at you. But other things, you know, just the way that you speak. So a lot of neurodiverse people are more blunt. And I don't mean being rude or mean because you can be blunt without being rude or mean. I have seen people um, use neurodiversity as an, as, as I'm going to say excuse, as an excuse (laughs) to just be mean. And I'm not talking about that, but I'm a very blunt person. Again, the culture that I was raised in is more blunt. So it was a little bit more receptive, but even still people are like, oh my God, here she go. And that, Uh, But when I moved here to the Midwest, people were just like, nah, did not understand what was going on at all. And they were always looking for some hidden meaning in what I was saying. There was no hidden meaning because I don't know. I don't really do hidden meaning well. Like I said it like this. This is all that I meant. Like what I said was it. So that's a sign of masking. How that can be even compounded and different in the black community is, you know, we always already code switch um, and code switching is generally talking about language. I mean, there's other types of code switching, but I think the, the one that gets the most discussion or discourse is um, like switching between African-American vernacular English and quote, quote, proper English or standard English. And so a lot of professional Black people uh, maybe use more African-American vernacular English at home and with their friends and in their communities and more standard English, you know, in their jobs. I'd say that I'm also not very good at masking or code switching like I never have been. Definitely as a physician, like there are words that I use when talking to other physicians to convey things that the general population don't know because they haven't went to medical school. But but like I was just talking to somebody yesterday day about y'all. Like I'm from the South. I say y'all. I, I never, ever like took that out of my vocabulary no matter where I went. I think for me, part of my neurodiversity is I honestly just don't do well with not being like who I am. Like who I am is who I am. So even though there's definitely some, some code switching, I'd say that I probably didn't mask a lot, but I know that is, I know that I'm in the minority when it comes to that with neurodiverse people, especially a lot of kids that I treat. So they mask all day long because now they kind of gotten to the age where they want, they don't want their peers to see them, you know, have a meltdown, but then mom gets all the meltdown behavior. <laughs> Because they're home and they don't have to mask anymore. So that's kind of what those two terms mean. Yeah. And and thinking about the masking, um, you know, I have a lot of clients, parent clients, whose children really do try to appear neurotypical all day long. They try not to do all of the self-soothing things they might do at home. And so they don't do any of those self-soothing things all day long. And sometimes you haven't mentioned it, but I know that, you know, sometimes stimming, you know, moving your body in a certain way can be soothing. And that's something that many autistic people or people who stim may not do or try to try to suppress when they are in neurotypical spaces, because it may be seen as just not done something improper to do. And there are some people who Um, have decided, I will not mask anymore. I will do these soothing behaviors. But a lot of those people are white people, right? And when you're a Black person, you already have this sort of attention on you, unwanted attention potentially. And so you're not trying to, you might still, even though you want to be your authentic self, 
you may still suppress that that stimming because it could be dangerous for you if somebody is afraid of you because you're doing that. Whereas a white child or a white adult may be able to, quote unquote, get away with that in a different way. Right. I agree. So when I'm, you know, kind of guiding my kids, my patients, I call my patients, my kids, when I'm kind of guiding my patients, you know, we talk about that. We talk through the benefit and risk. Like, I want to support you to be as authentic as you can, but I also want to keep you safe. So if it is not safe for you to do certain things, then we have to, you know, figure out how to accommodate you best as we can in those spaces and then allow you that regenerative time in, in your in spaces where you can, you know, stem. So one example that I have is I had a kid who actually at the time I didn't even realize it was a stem. This is when I was still in fellowship. But looking back, she was in dance. And so she did a lot of like, I don't know what you call it, but like the ballet jumps across the room mm, like pirouettes or something yeah pirouettes yeah that's what they were but she did a lot just like when she was thinking or just for whatever reason and she was a, a black child and I think she kind of was able to do that a little bit more because she went to a school an art school um, and she was known to be a dancer so for her it was safe to do that but the opposite thing would be jumping around let's say if you are a black kid male or female and like a non-safe school where people are already on edge, right? Where maybe there's fights every day or all or things like that. Suddenly getting up out your seat and jumping around <laughs> might not be safe. So then we have to discuss what are things that you can do that are safe or can you take breaks? Like, can we work in into your IEP where you can go to a separate room and kind of get some of those stems out or, you know, some of those sensory issues out? So we have to figure out a way to do things best as we can. You were talking about this a little bit about your own kids, but, you know, given that non-Black people might not be thinking about the Black neurodivergent experience, Mm -hmm. what are ways to make sure your child can access like anti-racist, neurodiversity affirming care? Like, what are questions that parents can ask educators or clinicians to get at the information to find out if they're a neurodiversity affirming person? You know, one of the signs, this is going to be controversial, but... One of the signs I immediately look for is the language they use and also the symbols they use. Autism Speaks is considered a a hate group by the neurodiverse community, by the majority. So just like with every group, everybody in in the group do not agree or do not have the same thoughts. But the majority of the neurodiverse community uh, considers Autism Speak a hate group. They're focused more on curing autism, which autistic people don't believe there needs to be a cure. Uh, The puzzle piece sign is not really accepted by the majority of the neurodiverse community. We uh, generally have, it's like an affinity sign with um, multiple colors. Our, Our goal, like in England, it's a gold affinity sign. If I'm talking to somebody and they start talking about Autism Speaks or they have like puzzle piece stuff everywhere, I know that they, even if they're trying their hardest, they haven't really tapped into listening to actual neurodiverse people. They're learning from neurotypical people who are talking about neurodiverse people. Another thing is ABA. ABA is not accepted in the uh, autistic community or, you know, the neurodiverse community. It's just not. Can you talk a little bit more about ABA? Can you say, because some parents, some parents may be listening. And I know in my practice, a lot of parents are referred to ABA therapy for their child. And they come to me and I'm like, oh, I don't know about ABA. And they're wondering, well, but this, but everyone's telling me to get ABA therapy for my child. And why is that a bad thing? So ABA is still as of right now, consider the gold standard treatment for autistic kids by the medical community. However, as is usual with lots of minorities, a lot of these things are decided without the people who are being affected input. So ABA was actually created by the same guy who created conversion therapy for gay people. So it's basically conversion therapy to make you neurotypical. His words were that when you have an autistic person, you have like the shell of a person, but not a real person until you do this ABA and basically make them neurotypical. So a lot of people will say, well, but ABA today isn't like the ABA back then. First of all, some of it is. I've seen it. When I was interviewing for a fellowship, which was only what eight years ago, and I'm not going to say any names, but there were a couple of places I interviewed that did traditional ABA. And this was even before I actually started, kind of got into the neurodiverse community, listened to neurodiverse people. I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Um, This is before I even really knew anything about it. But the other issue is even kind of more softer ABA is still compliance led. So it's still you do this with no questions asked and you get this treat. And we 
we want our kids to be able to regulate. So we want to give them tools to regulate it, you know, not be aggressive, not be violent, not tear up things, but not not to the point that they're just compliant with any and every adult, which is what ABA generally teaches, because one, adults abuse kids, all kids, but also disabled or neurodiverse kids are more likely to be abused. And so we don't want them just being compliant with no questions. I do think that occasionally there are some programs that are not true ABA that are labeled ABA for insurance purposes because most insurances only pay for ABA. If a parent brings this program to me and wants me to look at it, I'll look to see if it's really ABA or not. But but ABA in all of its forms is really compliance compliance based and compliance without questioning based. And that's that's one of the reasons it's harmful. The other reason it's harmful is just that that's what autistic people have said that is it, that it's given that it's been that it was traumatic for them. And some people have like actual PTSD from it. So generally what I recommend, if I have a parent that's dead set on, on doing ABA, you know, I can't I can't change. I recommend a lot of occupational therapy and speech therapy. I think people kind of forget that occupational therapy is not just for fine motor movement, fine motor movement. Um, they also teach emotional regulation skills. They they can tag team with speech therapy and teach social skills. And when I say social skills, you know, I'm not saying how to act more neurotypical, but you want your kid to be able to advocate for themselves. And you want them to be able to engage if they want to engage in friendships and other types of relationships. So how to teach those social skills. Um, Occupational therapy um, does a lot of sensory work. So how to uh, regulate your sensory needs, your input and output, how to do that in, in, in ways that are safe in different environments. So things that you can access at home versus school. Um, so they can teach a lot of skills. Another recommendation is if you have a young kid floor time. Um, therapy is good for younger kids. So I think toddlers, maybe three and below. I'm not sure if there's that A range, but you can look at floor, into floor time as an alternative if you have a younger kid. For older kids, collaborative practice maybe, but it's by Dr. Ross Green. It's collaborative and proactive solutions, it's called yes. now. <laughs> yes. So that, I think, you know, originally uh, he he recommended that for explosive kids for whatever reason, so it works really good for all children, to be honest, all yes. children in general, but good for artistic kids, too. And that so that collaborative approach is one thing that I try to really implore um, on my families. And so even in little ways. So I always talk to my patients alone unless they're like two or three. But starting about five, four or five years old, I start talking to, to them alone a little bit of time just so they can start understanding that I'm their physician. You know, I'm not their parents' physician. They could talk to me about what's going on. You know, I start even asking, what, what, are, what are the medicines making you feel like? These are the options we have. Which option do you think is best? Kind of start getting them to take that collaborative approach and ownership early on so they don't feel like things are being done to them. They are a partner in their treatment. And so some of the things that I'm hearing you say um, in terms of if I'm a parent looking for neurodiversity affirming care, I'm looking for someone who maybe knows the, knows why ABA is not always indicated and the, the harms that ABA can cause, right? And perhaps they also they also know that idea of, of choice, like what does the autistic child want for themselves rather than I'm a parent and I want my child to be able to do X, Y, and Z. So give them the ABA therapy so they look like a neurotypical child, right? And I'm thinking more along the lines of what does your neurodiverse child want in their life? What mm-hmm. do they want to be able to do? And then we give them the skills that they're saying that they want, right? Rather than pressuring them to have skills that maybe they're not interested in having. So one particular one that comes up a lot is is social skills. So again, the goal for me for social skills is for kids to be able to advocate for themselves, to be able to engage when they want to engage. Some neurodiverse people are extremely anxious, uh, want to engage, and can't. And And I feel like those people, we need to help them be able to engage. And then there's some neurodiverse people who are perfectly fine being loners. If you're fine being a loner, that's not affecting your self-esteem and it's not harming you in any way. Why would I force you to go out and play sports or go do this, I don't know, group or whatever the case is? You know, that could be a fine line too, because then, you know, depression sometimes looks like being a loner and it's a whole lot of stuff to figure out. And I, you know, I, I'm a psychiatrist, so I get that. But working with your team to figure all of that out and just not putting 
your standards on your kid is important. Mm -hmm. As you are looking for clinicians and help for your own children, what are you looking for when you are seeking out a new clinician? Because my kids are adopted, one of the things I look for is I look for people who don't want to label every behavior in adopted kids as a reactive attachment (laughs) disorder. That's a whole different podcast. But that's one of the things I look for for my kids. Uh, But as far as being neurodiverse, I look for people who either are neurodiverse or even if they're not neurodiverse, listen to neurodiverse people. My kid's psychiatrist doesn't have the exact same thoughts I have, but he has a lot of the same approaches to things that I have to how we, you know, how we help my children. The other thing that I look for, so a lot of times in school, like you can't really choose who the speech pathologist is in school, right? Or you can't choose who the special education teacher is in in school. So I just kind of make sure I put boundaries. Like I, I have put in every IEP, you are not allowed to force eye contact with my children. But you're saying what you're saying is something important is that parents can use that individual education plan to put some boundaries there. What teachers can't do. Right. Like. Right. Exactly. The things that are that absolutely do not work with my child. I think it's important for parents to know they can advocate for very specific Mm -hmm. things on an IEP. Yes. So definitely I do that. Another thing I do is. um one of my kids is, is very anxious, but also I think at times it doesn't bother him if he's alone. So one of their goals on their IEP is self-advocacy. So social skills from a standpoint of self-advocacy. I want him to be able to tell people when he needs help. I want them to be able to tell people when someone is, is messing with them or bullying them. Like I want them to be able to advocate for themselves. I don't know that that's their goal, but in this case, it is. this is parent overstepping. <laughs> it's something that they truly need for life skills, right? I don't necessarily have the goal that they develop two or three friendships by the end of the year. I don't care about that. If they have a a person they connect to and that develops, I'm super awesome. But I care that they are not in a spot to get hurt and not be able to let anyone know. Right, right. And I, you know, that's very important. I, I think when I'm talking about collaborating about those things, I'm thinking of an older kid. But I'm also, mm-hmm. but I, I do also think about, you know, young kids, as you're saying, knowing your own kid well enough to know that maybe they're fine only having one or two friends and not having 25 friends, right? And maybe that's okay for them. And maybe that makes them happy. But I think really thinking about who your child is and what your child wants to accomplish may be very different from you know, maybe you have two children who are autistic and they want very different things in their lives, right? Like they're not, you don't necessarily give them the same exact care. And I see a lot of kids um, that, you know, if I'm not, if I'm their third, fourth, fifth psychiatrist, or not even psychiatrists, physicians in general and, and adults in general, just do not do a good job of, again, we're adults. So we have to guide kids. I'm not saying let your kid run things. My kids absolutely do not run my house. So I'm not saying that. But I think starting to build that collaborative practice helps them change. It helps, you know, you give them a little bit of collaboration, a little bit. And as they get older, then they have that support as they grow into adults and no and no longer have such a structured environment and parents that are there every day to support them. So I see a lot of kids, you know, we're making a plan and I'm like, oh, we could do this or we could do this. Which one would you like to do? And they're like, I don't know. Like, what do you, you know, just tell me. And I'm like, nope. That's not what this is about, uh, because you're more likely to participate in your if I'm prescribing you medication and you have a say so on which medication it is. So it might be something like if you have depression. OK, these are the medications that treat depression. Like I'm obviously not going to prescribe something off the wall that doesn't treat depression. But these are the medications that treat depression. Let's go through them. Which one do you want to start? If you have a say in that, you're more likely to take it because you have a say in what you're taking. Absolutely. I say this with parents all the time. Even when it comes to making plans in your everyday life, if a child is, if you collaborate with your child, they're going to be much more cooperative than if you just tell them that they have no choice and they have to do, you know, exactly what you say, no matter what. And so as we're coming to the end of our conversation today, I'm wondering what's a myth about Black neurodiversity that you'd like to clear up? A myth? Well, I think just that it doesn't exist. I am in some groups for uh, Black women with ADHD, and a lot of those women are also autistic. And I remember one of them posting that a non-Black autistic person told her that Black autistic people don't exist, which I don't, I, I honestly don't even really understand that. 
But I do think that's also prevalent in, like, I don't think, like, if you go to a psychiatrist, I don't think they would say out loud, Black autistic people don't exist because that doesn't really make sense. But what happens is they don't really think about it. They don't really think they exist. So it's not something they look for or Black ADHD kids. You know, it's not something that they look for. So I think that's one of the myths is that we don't exist. We're out there. The other one, and this is just my pet peeve, I'm going to be honest, but that autistic kids like bland foods. And so that is very European centric, right? Or right American centric. Um, because if you go to Ghana and find an autistic black kid, their safe foods are still not going to be bland because there are no bland foods in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like one of my quote unquote safe foods going up with spaghetti, but you know, I, I I guess you can make spaghetti bland. It wasn't bland, but I guess you can make it bland. Um, So I think that idea that, you know, autistic kids are going to just eat chicken nuggets and fries or whatever the case is, it's just not, it's just not culturally competent. So those standards that we consider for autistic kids are generally not culturally competent. Because I mean, the same can be said for white kids too, that are from France. If you go to France and find a white autistic kid, they're not going to be eating chicken nuggets and fries. They're going to be eating their version of French safe food. So just Mm -hmm. being culturally competent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Dr. Rupert, for being here. Can you tell our audience how they can find you? You can go to my website, which is www.insightfulconsultant.org, and that'll be in the show notes. And from there, you can sign up for my mailing list. I'm getting ready to launch a podcast in the next couple months. But also from my website, you can, if you want to schedule a consultation about personal coaching, um, you can find me there. If you're a business or a school system uh, or a religious organization, hospital system, and you want DEI training, you can, you know, schedule there. If you go to that website, you'll be able to find me everywhere from that website. Great. It's been a pleasure having you here at Project Parenthood. Thanks so much for your time and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I hope that's helpful. You can learn more about Dr. Rupert's work at www.insightfulconsultant.org and follow her on Instagram at under underscore number one umbrella. That's U-N-D-E-R underscore one U-M-B-R-E-L-L-A. You can learn more about my work with parents at www.brooklynparenttherapy.com and follow me on Instagram at BKParents. That's B-K-P-A-R-E-N-T-S. If you have more questions about culturally affirming and neurodiversity affirming care for your child or any other parenting questions or stories, leave me a message at 646-926-3243. And be sure to let me know if it's okay to use your voice on the show. Or send an email to parenthood at quickanddirtytips.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Project Parenthood on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Project Parenthood is a Quick and Dirty Tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Dan Firebend with script editing by Adam Cecil. Our podcast and advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchings. Our marketing and publicity assistant is Davina Tomlin, and our intern is Cameron Lacey. 